Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Maven. If it's your first time to Maven, we want to say we are so glad you're here. And if it's your 51st time to Maven, thank you so much for your support and for continually coming back again and again to hear Jewish wisdom from the front row of your sofa. Get comfortable, take a virtual seat, get ready for what is absolutely bound to be one of our best Maven events ever with the amazing Mayim Bialik. So as a rabbi, I rarely start with a Jewish quote, but I do want to start today with Proverbs because the psalmist said, there are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. And I think the psalmist wrote that with Mayim Bialik in mind. She has surpassed all of them not only in her roles as a scientist, an author, a producer, a mother, a director, an actress, a host, an award winner, but she's even surpassed us here at Maven. Since we began in March, 2020, one week after the pandemic began, we have hosted over 350 guests. That has included Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, three-time Emmy Award winner, Julia Garner, Ambassador Michael Oren, author, thought leader, Barry Weiss, Michael Oren, the list goes on and on. And we've had huge registrations, especially when people were on lockdown at home. But today, of all days, Maya Bialik has surpassed all the registrations with over 1,500 people registered for this live event. That's not to say for the people that are coming to us streaming on Facebook or who will watch it on demand. You should know about our demand library. So we truly say thank you, Mayim, for what you've done. But there's a real reason why. From the first time I met Mayim Bialik, I knew she was truly one of a kind, and I'm not the only one. Whether you know her from her role on Blossom, as Blossom, Amy in The Big Bang Theory, Kat in Call Me Cat or you know her from Mayim's Breakdown, where she shares personal stories of her own journey, her podcast breaking down the stigma of mental health, whether you know her from her davening at UCA Hillel, her academic pursuits as a neuroscientist with a PhD, her advocacy work for Judaism, for Graves' disease, for feminism, for veganism, or maybe from her books, or maybe most recently from her movie that she wrote, directed, and produced, or from that little known show that she's now co-hosting that used to be led by Alex Trebek, Jeopardy, for those of you who are living in a cave. Mayim is a force of nature and she's just getting started. It is my pleasure to welcome to Maven, Mayim the Alec. Hello. Hi, Mayim, welcome. Did I do it? Hi. You Thank did you. it, you were amazing. <laughs> I hope that introduction did you justice because you are so deserving oh i really appreciate it um you know mostly i'm glad i wasn't on camera because i was just blushing the whole time um but thank you thank you very much and you know it's really um it's an honor to be to be here to be part of um aju's maven experience and you know those are all people that are I incredible leaders and figures and it's it's really it's an honor to be among them so i do like to win things though i'm a very competitive person so <laughs> oh i am too so i'm glad we started that and before we even say anything i just want to offer our condolences on behalf of all our audience on leslie jordan i know you haven't even watched the last episode that he was in right. um, but we just want to offer our condolences and our prayers and may god comfort you among the mourners of zion Thank you. It's um it's been a, a very challenging time and uh our first episode without him um is also very challenging. That'll be on um Thursday night. I don't think I'll be able to watch that one either, but um I do appreciate that. So, let's dive right in, which is that you're a second generation Jewish immigrant. You're a relative of the a distant relative of the famous Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik. Mm -hmm. You're the first woman in your family to have a bat mitzvah. You are outwardly Jewish. I'm outwardly and inwardly. I can't. And inwardly. <laughs> Tell us about your Jewish journey. Um, gosh. Um, you know, my, I, I hesitate because, you know, my Jewish journey is obviously special to me because it's mine. Um, and 
I'm very grateful, you know, to get to be in a position and in a place where I get to share it. Um, but there's also a certain amount of, you know, kind of ingrained humility about just existing and how everyone has a story. And, you know, I, I don't believe that mine is more special or, you know, more unique. Um, but I'm actually going to take these off. Um, but get comfortable. Yeah, but I, We're having wine uh, at my house. Just casual, just casual. casual. Um, you know, my, my Jewish journey, um, I, I really only know about kind of from my great grandparents. Um, that's kind of where our history and, and many histories from um, the wave of immigration that my family was part of in Eastern Europe sort of ends, you know. Um, I, I come from a very modest family. Um, on my mother's side, um, my my grandmother was from a village near Monkach. And I say a village near Monkach because Monkach would have been a larger place than where my grandmother was from. She was from a town without um, electricity and she um, came from a, a humble family. My great grandparents, um, I think everybody was tailors in, in those days, but they were, they, they sold cigarettes, you know, from a cart in the street. That's, um, you know, that was my family's story. Um, my, my grandmother arrived um, at Ellis Island um, in her teens. She was um, an orphan by then. And um, half of her siblings survived and half stayed in Eastern Europe and did not survive. Um, one of her sisters um, hid as a Gentile in Budapest. And that was my Tante Fagi, who actually passed away during COVID at 99. Um, so some very, very powerful um, women on my mom's side and also a lot of tragedy and pain, you know, in those stories. My mother's father was, um, my grandmother also, I should say, was um, Hungarian. That was the Czech-Hungary border then. On my mother's father's side, like Ukrainian, Polish, um, what I we're know- Mutts. Is, We're Mutts. Right, right. Well, he left He left school at 15 um, to be a cap maker. He made hats, so he didn't finish his education. Um, but he was a lechazen. He had a beautiful voice, and he was a lay cantor for really the rest of his life. Um, my, my grandfather had an exceptional, exceptional voice. And, and also talked all the time. Like he was the person who never would stop talking. Um, and um, he came to America with his parents and with his sister and um, two brothers. And they came um, after um, you know, a variety of pogroms that plagued those regions. They were not part of an early immigration uh, wave though. They were a later wave kind of just before the, the Shoah began um, properly as it were. Um, and my, the, what's interesting about my mother's side, which is a large part of my Jewish, uh, you know, journey is that my, my grandparents, one was Litvak and one was Galiziana, which, um, this is like a very deep dive into a very niche, uh, distinction, but it means that I grew up with a mixed dialect of Yiddish because my mother was raised with one parent who spoke the Litvak dialect and one who spoke the Galiziana dialect. Um, culturally that's considered a mixed marriage for us Eastern European Jews. And so you grew up speaking Yiddish. I did. I grew up, I mean, I, I grew up with Yiddish in the home and um, I actually raised my children, you know, their first words and phrases were also Yiddish. You know, to me, it's the language of babies and uh, <laughs> that's, uh, it's, it is a beautiful language. And I actually, when I studied at UCLA, um, I did a minor in Hebrew and Jewish studies and actually did a year of Yiddish. So got to um, properly learn how mixed up my dialect was. And basically there's a set of words that my grandmother used and I speak her dialect for those. And there's a set of words that my grandfather used and I I speak uh, his dialect for that. And all father. of them are in your movie. Um, kind, or most kind, of them. Yes, kind of. I, I would say kind of. There's a lot of Yiddish in, in my movie and in my life. Uh, my dad's side was a more assimilated American Jewish experience. His mother was born in Warsaw, um, but came over quite young and did not have really any Eastern European flair about her. You know, my mother's parents never really had a full command of the English language. They always lived in survivor Yiddish speaking communities. They never drove. I think they were on a plane twice in their life. Um, you know, very, very different culturally. And my dad's parents were more like, um, you know, cosmopolitan or metropolitan. My father's father was my only American born grandparent. He was born um, in New York and he was an accountant. And I thought he was an accountant because he was the American. Like I thought that's what Americans did. Um, but on my grandmother's side, my, my family was from Warsaw. Um, they were not well off. Um, my great grandfather um, came over first. He was a house painter. 
And then he brought uh, my great grandmother who I'm named for, Mariam, and they called her Mayam. Um, he brought her over with my my grandmother and all the other kids. And then my father was raised, um, both my parents were, were born in the South Bronx, um, that is Bronx Park South. And it was a very lovely and beautiful time for them to be raised in that community. It was a lot of immigrants and kids singing doo-wop on the corners. Uh, my parents were both born during World War II. Um, so that carries a lot of the weight of the war. Uh, my grandfather actually served in World War II on my father's side. Again, I thought because he's the American, he does all the American kind of things. And my father moved to Westbury in the 1950s, which was part of the American dream then, was to get out of you know the tenement houses. Um, he met my mother when they were teenagers. They dated for three years. Uh, my mother was raised very religious, um, Orthodox of the Eastern European variety. And um, she had never eaten out when she met my dad because they were kosher and very strict. And the story is she ordered lobster on the first date, um, telling my father two things, that she did not want to be religious anymore and that she had um, very expensive taste. And um, my parents were married for seven years without having kids. My mom was 18 when they got married and my dad was 21. Um, my mother finished college. Both my parents were English teachers and civil rights activists and um, made documentary films before I was born, which is a huge part of the Jewish ethics that I was raised with, um, you know, um, to be quite frank. And um, my brother was born in Manhattan. I was born in San Diego where my grandparents had moved. I was sent to reform um, synagogue. I went to Temple Israel of Hollywood. Um, it was not a celebrity synagogue back then. It was, you know, a little shul of a lot of kind of immigrant style families. And um, I'm grateful that my parents sent me to, you know, to religious school. And, you know, even yeah. though they have, go this ahead. This person comes from a tenement and suddenly becomes a child actor at a young age. How did that happen? Um, well, you know, I was, I was, uh, I, I had a, 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 a pretty quote normal, you know, upbringing. I, I was raised in Hollywood. We, we rented a house um, really my whole life. We had one bathroom for four people and um, mm -hmm. something was always broken in the house, but that's just how it was, you know, and that's how I grew up. We didn't have a lot of money. I went to public school my whole life. Um, I enjoyed performing in school plays, but never did I think, you know, that that would would lead to the life I have. You know, the short story is I kept saying to my parents, I really want to be a, an actor because I saw kids on TV and it didn't occur to me that no one looked like me on television. You know, back then there was the all American look, which was like blonde hair, blue eyes and very small features, you know, and I had blonde hair and blue eyes, but I did not have small features. So um, my mom had been the nursery school director at our synagogue um, for several years and she had finished that job and she said if you really want to try this you know I'm not working and we can try and um, you know within a year I had my first had my first um, job and um, you know I, I did several episodes of things like Webster and you know like TV shows Facts of Life um, but I was cast in Beaches um, literally like a year after I had started acting so I started acting in almost in junior high I was 11 and a half um, and yeah, Beaches came out the day of my bat mitzvah. That was the premiere. It was that weekend? You remember your Torah portion? Um, I do. I'm. I believe I'm. By gosh, I'm uh, Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. Um, my bat mitzvah was a very important day for me, and you know, very interesting time in my life in terms of my career. You know, my life was kind of never the same. You know, a year after Beaches came out, I was starring in my own TV show. You know, Blossom, which ran for five years. We were on, uh, well, we premiered after the Cosby show, but then we were on after the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And that ran from the time I was 14 to 19. Um, I went to Jewish, um, like five weekends of Jewish camp throughout the year. I'm a product of Jewish Federation and of the scholarship. Did you go to Havarat Noir? I did. I'm a product of the Jewish okay. Federation, like Dor Hadash, Havarat Noir, Chalutz. Um, and, you know, that was really honestly what solidified a tremendous amount of my Jewish identity um, beyond the fact that I had never met, you know, conservative Jews, meaning in terms of denominations, I, I had never said, you know, Hametim instead of Hakol in, you know, in the Amidah. Like I learned so much about like obviously prayer and technical things, but more of my identity of like, who are Jews? Where do we fit? What is anti-Semitism? And, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I'm sure we'll get to this, you know, there's so much in the press now about anti-Semitism and, you know, people ask me like, what do you tell your kids? And, you know, and um, it's like, I've been telling my kids the same things that 
my parents, you know, had to tell me that we all tell our kids um, as Jews in this country. So I have a, a very strong, you know, foundation and understanding, um, you know, who, who I am and who the Jewish people are. And I'm grateful to those federation programs. They, they no longer exist, which is really, really sad. There are a lot of other ways that, um, you know, that hopefully other teens can have the experiences that I had. Um, I took on more observance in college um, when I left my parents' home, as it were, and I went to study neuroscience and I got a, a minor in Hebrew and Jewish studies. Um, and yeah, I took on more observance. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Seidler Fowler was my Rav and I had never met a modern Orthodox person like walking amongst us. And so I started learning with him. He encouraged me to learn Hebrew before Yiddish and it was a very smart thing to do. And I ended up really falling in love with a lot of the technical aspects of our language, um, our revived language. And, um, you know, I, I got married. I had a traditional Jewish wedding. Um, I have raised two children in the covenant, as it were. And um, one was bar mitzvah before COVID. And my younger son was bar mitzvah during COVID. My children are 14 and 17. Um, and they are, um, you know, they're sweet little neshamas. You know, they're sweet little souls that um, um, their father and I have been entrusted you know to take care of and that's kind of my jewish journey i've always had a i faith. love it yeah, i love it because it's a in... great foundation for us to get started which is yeah. most actors change their name especially mm -hmm. so that it's hip you have a recognizable jewy name right water of life right it's mayim chayim right and right mayim chaya. yeah you have done a lot of things that have really not only honored your tradition and your heritage but really brought Judaism out into the forefront. So tell me, how have you retained and how have you been able to sort of hold on to your Jewish pride in the face of all these Jewish critics? Um, you know, I, I never really thought of it as like holding on to my Jewish pride. It's kind of like um, I get to be myself, you know, in all arenas of my life. And, um, you know, for me being... Um, you know, being a person who believes in the halachic system, you know, believes in the the system of the written law and the oral law and and really wanting to kind of grapple with my tradition and and with our texts like that's who I am, whether I'm acting or not, you know, whether I have a social media following or not. But that's really rare, Mayim, especially in the acting world. They say they have the acting self and the self. And yet here you are. You have this grok nation, this community of followers that you have a podcast where you're incredibly personal. How do you face being in Hollywood, both keeping yourself private and being so public and down to earth? I'm sure you get that question a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of it is sort of, um, you know, in the position that I'm in, I, I, I absolutely, you know, have wondered like, what what is the purpose, you know, for being such a public person who has all of these very, very, um, you know, deep beliefs. Like it's very unpopular to talk about your belief in God, you know, I think in, in many circles, but especially in Hollywood circles. And, um, you know, I, I really feel like um, I chose to put in a lot of, a lot of years, you know, exploring the aspects of my heart and my brain that our tradition, you know, leaves open for me to explore. Meaning I, I, I feel really grateful, you know, for my teachers, for the people who have taught me, not just how to respond to critics, because I have a lot of critics in the Jewish community as well. Um, but we all have a lot of critics. <laughs> right. But, but meaning like how to be able to say like, I, I don't get to tell you how to live your life, but here's why Shabbat matters to me. Or, you know, there's no such thing as bad Jews. People love to tell me they're bad Jews. There's no such thing. You're just Jewish or you're not. And then you have different levels of observance. And, but, you know, like, I don't, I don't hold that kind of judgment. And I'm grateful, you know, that I was kind of raised as I took on more observance to be in a community that was, that was open. And so for me, if I then exist in a public space, I don't want to hide that part of me. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's important, you know, we're a very small portion of the population. We're, 
we're 2% of the US population, but most people who live in cities feel like we're everywhere, which doesn't feel good at all when people say that about us. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that if I can put kind of a, a positive face on many aspects, not just of like Judaism, but even of a Judaism that really is like, it's very intellectually based. It's very God based for me. You know, I've 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 never stopped believing in God since I first knew God existed, just like I've never stopped believing in gravity since it was explained to me, you know? <laughs> but you also, Maya, it, I think it comes naturally for you, but it takes a lot of courage, especially in Hollywood, to be out front with your beliefs, whether it's about parenting or veganism. And this movie that you just wrote, directed on uh, about the death of your father is very autobiographical, and it shares... Why tell the story? Why put yourself out there in such a really transparent way? Um, yeah, the the movie is As They Made Us, and it stars Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen. And I uh, cried through the whole thing, like yes. to the point that my husband was like, put the put the computer down. <laughs> Um, yeah, Simon Helberg from the Big Bang Theory is in it, um, and Diana Agron or Agron. Um, and so also it, a Jewish girl. Yeah also Jewish. Um, yeah, the, I wrote the movie. It's not specifically, it's not exactly autobiographical, but what I did is I based it on sort of the journey that I took, um, through, you know, my, my father's, through my father's, um, illness and his, his death, he passed away. Um, it'll be eight years, Pesach. Um, and you know, the things that come up when you are, you know, really confronting head on, um, family dynamics and, and grief and the process of remembering and forgetting, um, you know, the, the question why is it's like, I don't mean to sound pretentious, but it's like, because that's the art form, you know, that I choose to live. And we all have different ways of processing and dealing with things. And when you're a person who's a writer, you know, uh, we write, and I really didn't write this movie, um, because I thought it would ever get made. I'm even shocked that it ever did get made just because it's it's a very, very um, enormous feat. Writing the script is actually the, the <laughs> I'd say the only fun thing about making a movie is, you know, getting to write as, as a writer. Um, and it was a really, um, it's very personal and also it's very, very universal. And I've I, I've I've heard that the the movie specifically resonates with people, yes, from ethnic backgrounds. You don't have to be Jewish, but you know, from families where there's enmeshment mixed with love, mixed with you know complexity, and um, you know, directing it was because I I literally had this experience of like I can see what I want it to look like. I never thought I would get actors like Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen um, to, to work on this film. Simon Helberg was the first person I had cast in my head. My father passed away while I was working on The Big Bang Theory. And I always thought, gosh, if I can ever get my heart and my thoughts together, I would want to write for Simon. Um, and wow. that's what I did. So, um, you know, it was a very small film. I think it's on Showtime is where it is. That's who kind of bought I, it. I watched it on Netflix, but let me just add, I started keeping track of the number of Jewish references from saying There's the Shema with the kids yep. to the Hanukkah sign in the kitchen to Hey Boy Chick to Dr. Ashkenazi to the editor-in-chief of Modern Jew to Yo Semite to Misguide Kishka's Yiddish references galore. And I think that says a lot about you. So let's pivot for a second, Mine. Mm -hmm. That is brave. And so have you faced anti-Semitism? I mean, we're in a very noisy cacophony of public anti-Semitism now. And you have been very clear about your Judaism. Is it something that you faced? Are you scared of? How are you dealing with it? Um, there's so many ways to answer this. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, what feels like the best way. Um, you know, I, I know we may have a lot of, you know, people with us today who maybe were not raised Jewish um, and welcome. Uh, but, you know, I think it sounds it might sound funny to say that, you know, for many of us, especially those of us who whose families have been touched very recently um, by the Holocaust. Um, you know, I was raised with a very specific knowledge of the what it feels like to be a stranger in a strange land. I was raised with stories of, you know, a people rising from the ashes to try and create a place in the world where we were free. Um, 
you know, free to live and protect ourselves and free to exist with no one being able to say, get out. So I was raised with this notion of the, the tenuousness of, of what it is to be a minority. So I have faced, I have faced anti-Semitism the entire time I've been a public person, you know, and since social media began, I've had problems. I mean, I don't even know if I've had problems. I don't have any problems. The problems are that other people have problems. And, you know, what I learned, and I, I, you know, I was at UCLA when the beginnings of equating Zionism with racism began, meaning I was one of the students cleaning swastikas off Bruin Walk at UCLA Mm -hmm. in, in the, um, in the early and mid nineties. So I was on a public university campus with a very large Jewish and Muslim population when these conversations started heating up. So it's been part of my life since, you know, actively since I was in my late teens and into my twenties. So then being a public figure just meant that I now had a place where people could make threats and hate me simply because I was Jewish. It had nothing to do with my politics and That's something, you know, people used to say like, oh, well, it's about the settlements or, oh, it's about this. What I found is it's about that there are people who simply do not like Jews and they hate Jews and they don't want Jews to exist. So I kind of stayed quiet about that. And then you see all this stuff that continues building and bubbling. And I hate to say that I'm not terribly surprised because it's not like I viewed the world as this cynical person, like everyone hates us. I have to be afraid. But this is a reality, and it's been our reality for thousands of years. And the complexities of the conversation have shifted, you know. And I, I, I'm a huge fan of Dave Chappelle, and I watched his SNL, you know, monologue, and I was like, "What's he going to say?" Um, you know, I'm following. And by the way, Kanye's music, my kids all had on replay. Uh, of course, I mean most of most of America did and does. And I like to leave Kanye aside because I think there's some very, very specific. Um, mental health flags that have been prominent for some time. So I just like to kind of like leave that aside because it didn't take Kanye to make people say death to the Jews. And it, you know, my freeways where I drive had signs, you know, with people saluting Hitler. Like that's what was happening in the city that I live in. The restaurant, the kosher restaurants I go to have been vandalized, you know, like that's, that's what this feels like now. It feels horrible and it feels scary. And of course there are those among us who have been living, waiting for this. Like it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And we all wanted to believe like, no, it's gone away. Not so much. And so there's been a real kind of, for me, like a real recalibration of like, how do I ensure that the information my kids are seeing when they turn on their phones to go to TikTok or to go to Instagram, you know, how do I ensure that that doesn't speak louder than the conversations that we need to have at our Shabbos table? You know, um, what does it mean when people say Jews run the industry? What does it mean that Jews have prominent positions in many fields that have a really interesting historical and sociological history? Why are we in show business? Why have we become doctors and lawyers? Why are we money lenders? Like, there right. are- what were we excluded from that forced us into those positions? Well, and also like to say like, and, and this is, you know, when I speak to my kids who are teenagers, when you can't own land, what do you do? You know, like, what are your, what are the professions open to you? And when you are an immigrant family, and I have many friends, like I went to public school in Los Angeles, almost everybody was from an immigrant family. We were all told to be doctors and lawyers. Every kid that came from an immigrant family, that was the American dream. Jews are no exception. And, and sure, there are Jews who have been here many, 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 many generations. And it's not that we're looking to rely on the Holocaust as the anchor point for everyone to understand us. But for our people, it is very recent that we have experienced a lot of horrifying things that I'm just going to say it began in many ways with the things we see now, with propaganda, with basically different versions of a blood libel. Like that shouldn't feel comfortable to any peace loving person. Can I just say, Maya, I'm like, I think what's disarming about you is that you're like this Hollywood royalty. I'm not saying that to be, but literally you like, there's, you went from child actor, most child actors become drug addicts to like this Renaissance woman, right? Like neuroscientist and what I'm not saying it to flatter you. It's just like, that's the facts, right? You're now host of Jeopardy. 
And yet you're incredibly down to earth and, and brave. And I think one of the questions that people ask about is, you know, who inspires you? Who enables you to, to really be yourself, even in the face of all this criticism? Because I see the hate that comes at you. I'm a rabbi in a tiny little world and I get all kinds of hate. You get, you know, you say one thing and it was misconstrued by the media. Who inspires you and how do you get inspired? You know, this is a hard question because, you know, I've, I've been raised by so many people. Um, but you know, my, my mom, I'm assuming she was, she didn't text me and say she couldn't get on. So, you know, my, like, if you think I'm tough and, you know, multifaceted and around, like you should, you know, my parents, my father of blessed memory, like my parents were, they were, they're nuts, but they were amazing people. And like everything about me is because of the challenges that they faced as a young, you know, civil rights couple, like I'm a product of my parents and my parents are products of their parents. And that's where I feel that like, I'm, you know, I didn't need the DNA test to tell me how Jewish I was, you know, like I'm that woman, like I'm I just like all of us, you know, who are part of this tribe, like that's what I'm born from. I'm born from the- But pro- not everybody has the drive or the courage. Where does your drive but, come from? I mean, you know, I I, I do. I, I think, I really do believe. I think a lot of it is, you know, my mom, I came out, I came out butt first. I was a breach, a breach birth. I was born, she didn't take any drugs. And she said like, that was my introduction to the world. It was like, I'm going to do it this way. Um, and, and the fact is, you know, my mother was my, my partner in coming into this world. She's the one who did it, you know? So when I think of like, I was this dynamic spirit and I was very feisty, like, you know, I'm a product. I really am. I believe I'm a product of my parents and, you know, Rabbi Chaim Seidler Feller was the person who really, you know, kind of gave me, um, the strength and the, the education to, to feel pride, you know, in my Jewishness. Um, but you know, I've, I've really, I've been raised by, um, by all of my teachers, you know, people always ask me like, who's your role model? Like, I don't have that. I remember that like, you know, my grandmothers were these amazing women who were like, to be honest, like really miserable and depressed for most of their lives. Like women's lives were very, very hard. Um, the way that my grand grandmothers grew up, but like, they were fierce. They were amazing. You know, my, my mother's mother had golden, golden a hint. She could make anything, fix anything, cook anything. Like Mm -hmm. those are the women I watched, you know, I, that's really like, I grew up in kitchens. I grew up watching my mother bake. Like that's sort of who I am. And, you know, I'm a combination of my parents, you know, rebelliousness and also their obedience. Right. Um, Yeah. And you don't shy away from that, which life is hard. You talk about your childhood, not having a lot of money. You talk about mental illness and people not being happy. And now you've created a podcast, right? Mine's Breakdown, Mind the Alex Breakdown, which with Jonathan Cohen, who I love. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to really address the stigma around mental health. Why is that important to you? Um, yeah, I, um, the podcast, you know, for those of you who are curious, like, it's like everybody has a podcast. Yes. And we, no, not everybody has a podcast, <laughs> well, no, but I'm, but I'm saying like a lot of, a lot of actors and a lot of, you know, people, right. but we're, we're on, you know, Spotify or, you know, other places that podcasts exist. And, um, you know, we, Jonathan, uh, I'm looking because he normally sits right here. I'm sitting in my podcast studio and that's where he normally sits. Um, Jonathan and I, um, we're writing partners and, um, We've known each other a long time. And over COVID, I noticed that, you know, things that I really had felt were kind of more under control, like my anxiety and, you know, things that a lot of us have um, really spiked. And COVID was a real test for, I think, a lot of us. And um, I don't know if we all passed the test, but what I know is that um, we wanted to start a podcast that used my neuroscience background and my background with receiving just about every psychiatric diagnosis, you know, from the time I've been a teenager, um, we wanted to provide people a vocabulary. Jonathan and I believe that mental health is a right. Um, having a vocabulary, knowing the difference between panic attacks and anxiety attacks, knowing what bipolar disorder is, um, knowing what medications can do and what they can't do. We feel like those things are just a, a human right. And our podcast is, is that. It's kind of a, a general public forum for all things mental health. 
Um, Jonathan has a background in in Reiki and um, and energy work and somatic work. And um, so between the two of us, we share all the things that have that we've been told are wrong with us, um, what has worked for us, what hasn't. And we've even started delving into learning about a lot of the more alternative and holistic things that, um, you know, people in the 60s talked about. And we were all like, expand your consciousness. That's for hippies. And now right, yoga was for hippies. Remember? Exactly. And now like every therapist and every doctor's like, I really think you need to meditate. And I'm like, seriously, I thought that was right. Like you need to do acupuncture. That was like the, I mean, I remember in high school, that was the weird girl. Right. And now it's, well, I'm that weird girl. I'm yeah. So was I, to be honest. So, um, anyway, so, so Jonathan and I, we interview, um, you know, we've interviewed um, people who are experts in the mental health field and and prominent people who are experts in their own mental health. Leslie Jordan's episode is phenomenal. Um, he talked a lot about his journey and his um, his addiction history. Dustin Hoffman, who I don't think has, I think he's done one podcast before. Dustin Hoffman sat and did an entire podcast with me and Jonathan, and it was very, very powerful. He did it um, when the movie was coming out. Um, Matthew McConaughey came on our podcast and we, so many interesting people, a lot of, you know, a lot of really cool Jewish comedians, Eliza Schlesinger and Moshe Kasher, um, Chelsea Handler came on. So we have a great time. She Jewish? We, you, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I feel like we're, doing, we're, we're getting fodder for Adam Sandler's new song. <laughs> uh, yes. No, I would love that. Um, anyway, so, uh, that's the podcast and we also have a website and we, we, you know, we, we post things and we post, um, when we, we, we release an episode every Tuesday. So that is, um, a big part of my life and a big part of Jonathan and my passion is, um, going on this journey with people as we all learn more about the importance of, you know, diet and mental health sleep. I mean, I've made a lot of changes, um, really since COVID and it's really because of Jonathan and the podcast. I love that. I love that you walk the walk and talk the talk. So let's pivot. We got to talk. We're getting, I have no less than 64 questions, correct, coming in right now. So we got to talk a little bit about your characters. Which character do you identify most with? Um, you know, I identify in different ways, um, you know, with, with all of the characters that I play. Also, mom, stop texting me. I'm literally live. Like, okay, stop. but I want to say to your mom, you did good. So <laughs> she can text as much as she wants. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm in the third season of this show, Call Me Cat, which is on Fox. Um, and you can watch it on Hulu also, because apparently like that's how television works. Like you can watch it on Hulu now. Um, you know, I, I love this character that I get to play now. You know, I love playing Amy Farrah Fowler on the Big Bang Theory. And it was really, really fun. I mean, to have any job in the industry for nine years is ridiculous. And it was a beautiful, beautiful experience to be part of that show, which was already a hit, you know, when I joined with Melissa Rausch in season four. Um, but I have to say, I really love, um, I love the show that we are making and we absolutely miss Leslie very much. Um, but, and you know, Kat's we, Jewish in the show. Kat is Jewish. Um, and and will there be celebrations are- and rituals coming? Yeah, we've actually, um, there's a, sh- I think in the first episode, there is a Shiva scene where uh, mirrors are covered and we've definitely had Jewish references. Um, the episode, the first episode that Leslie Jordan is not in, um, which airs this Thursday night is a Chris Mika episode. And, you know, when I first saw the title, I was like, oh, is this going to be like, let's all combine and be happy. But it's really, it's not a hit you over the head, but um, there's, It's a little bit of like Easter eggs, as it were. Um, I'm wearing Hanukkah jewelry in every single scene of that show. So that's a little fun. You wear a Jewish star often. I wear, yes, in my personal life and even on the red carpet, you know, when I was first nominated for an Emmy um, and people- Which by the way, you have what? Four. Uh, four. I I lost four times. That's how my children say it. I lost four times. Um, But, you know, it was a very big deal, like- I really wanted to wear a mug and David because I always wear one. And it was like, oh, don't know, like at that time. And like, we don't, the stylist was like, oh, so, so like I hid a mezuzah um, in the, in my, like in my outfit, the first couple of times I was nominated. And now, especially with what's going on, I'm like, I wear it all. Like, I'm just going to wear, I wear it all the time. I wear a ring. I got earrings, like all the things, especially when I'm doing public things and on call me cat this Thursday, like there's something that like, I was shocked that they even like were okay with me wearing. It's like very blatant and it's in the first scene. So that's kind of fun. And um, also on Jeopardy, you've made comments about your clothes. Like it's really important for you to represent your people, which by yeah, the way, the I amount wear, of people that yeah. have said in the comments, why aren't you the full-time host? You're the best. 
I just have to shout that out there to you. Well, because I have another full-time job and I'm very grateful that Ken Jennings exists and is so fantastic because I, I work essentially two full-time jobs, but on Jeopardy, um, I do, I wear um, a pin that has a Mogan David, a Hamsa, an I, and a Chai, and I wear that on every single outfit. So you will see that it's a little, it's a- Where is it? On your- Right. It's, on, it's it's on my lapel, but if I wear a dress, sometimes it's on like the collar of the dress. But yeah, I almost always wear a blazer. Right. Um, and um, yeah, I've had that pin since I'm 16 years old, I think, 17 years old, something like that. Um, and I also I have a, a Jewish star ring. I don't know if you can tell it's kind of like a 3D Jewish star ring. And so I usually I wear that as well. Um, yeah, you know, to me, I'm not, I, I don't believe in advertising, you know, we don't proselytize, I, there's no one I need to gather. Um, it's not, you know, it's not part of our, our tradition. Um, but I think it's important. I think it's important for people to see we exist, we're out there, we do all sorts of things. And um, I'm not afraid, you know, I, and used when, to, I used to be afraid. I used to be I more afraid. I was going to say, what changed for you, Mayim? Um, the events surrounding the last administration were very complicated for many Jews. I have many, many friends who stopped wearing their yarmulkes during that time. Um, and it's funny because as fear kind of grew, as I understand it did, for me, I think, yeah, I, I'm I, I am aware how blessed I am to have more of a place of safety. I mean, I don't think my security company appreciates it. Um, but I, I did, I lost a lot of my, my fear and my, my delicateness around talking about it. It used to be like, Ugh, I'm a Zionist. And now it's like, that's right, people. This is what Zionism is. It means that you believe in the right to an autonomous Jewish state that protects itself where no one can send us out and no one can push us into the sea. That's it. And that's not a statement about my politics. You don't know what party I vote for. You don't know if I'm religious or not. You don't know how I feel about a Palestinian state. That's what Zionism is. I'm like, I just like, I can't anymore like act like there are things that I say that are going to incite people to say death to the Jews, because apparently it'll just get said no matter, even just like from this face. Right. I was going to say, and what's also interesting is that there are critics that are like, oh, well, Mayim has so much power now in Hollywood. Of course she does it. But you've been doing it from <laughs> the beginning. And I think it's so I wish I had power. I yes, wish I, I was going to say, but you've been doing So lots of questions. I One, when are you going to host SNL? And I don't have research. Have you ever hosted SNL? SNL has never had me host. Okay, um, SNL. I'm putting it out there. Lauren Michaels, you need well, to do I can I can tell you the um, SNL has really a history of having people host if they have, if they star in a movie or if they have another project associated with NBC. I was on Blossom. I mean, for five years, I was an NBC talent. Um, I've always wanted to be on SNL. We've asked many, many times, but this is just, this is the thing. This is how the industry works. There's very specific ways that things are decided and um, sitcom actors you know, typically need to make a shift to another aspect of the industry to be considered kind of um, SNL worthy. And I have a lot of self-deprecating opinions about why I don't get to do a lot of things that other actors do. So we won't get into those. We don't need to get into that. We'll, we'll put that, we'll wait, we'll put that for the therapist. So what's Mayim's mission? Um, like my personal mission, like my industry mission, my- You answer. Um, you know, my mission is to leave this world um, a little more repaired than I found it. And that is, you know, straight from what our people have been told to do. You know, I don't know. I I don't know about chosenness. You know, we're chosen for every century having complexity and persecution. So the notion of what are we chosen for is to be a light among nations, whatever that looks like. Um, does not mean that we're better. It does not mean that we're more. It does not mean that we're more deserving of anything in particular. But I do believe that spiritually and historically and genetically and culturally, um, I am connected to a legacy. You know, I, I believe that. And I believe that for Jews of choice. Um, you know, my, my mother-in-law, who um, is a Jew by choice and converted after um, I married her son um, and, you know, made her grandchildren, um, she said she was at Sinai. She was just standing in the back, you know, like we, we are a people who we, we fix, we fix the world, you know, those shards of light that scattered everywhere at creation. Um, we put them back together one by one. I'm, I'm really just like another, I'm another Halutznik. I'm another pioneer of, you know, hopefully 
uh, and when I say a messianic age, I hope people understand I'm not, this is not a Christian concept. The concept of that there will come a day when, when there will be no more war and where peace will sort of take over. Um, that's the world that I do believe that we get to keep building. And I really, I, I'm just, I am another happy servant of God. Like I literally, when people are like, how do you not have caffeine? I'm like, I wake up with just like the love of God and like the heart of a lion. Like, here we go. I know listeners are sitting there being like, who is this human? Like, <laughs> when does she sleep? Like you wake up assuming that you go to sleep, but like, when do you sleep? Yeah. Because I see a thread in your whole career and in your life, which is that you are a fixer, that uh -huh. you really are taking very seriously the task that God has given you, mm -hmm. that you pride yourself, but you are incredibly accessible and real. You are brave. I see that. And it's not because I'm like a fan. It's that I know you and I see you do that. So what do you want people to say about you, Mayim? Oh, um, that just hit me. Um, you know, I did the best I could. We all do the best that we can, you know? Um, I want to fix everything. I really do. Like I, I want to, you know, I want every homeless person that I see to know that like I can give them a meal. You know, I, I really, I have that, um, I have that kind of that heart, you know, my, both of my parents were like that. We all would like cry if we saw a special needs person on the street, like just like all of us crying. And, um, that's just, you know, that's the kind of heart I was given. So, um, yeah, I would like people to say that I did the best I can to make this world a little less broken, you know, and my children are always like, we know mama, it's a broken world, but like, that's, that, that's it. We're all living in, in Gallus, you know, we're all living in some sort of exile from, from a wholeness that I believe is the, the world deserves, not just the Jewish people, you know, we, we all deserve that. And it's very, you know, I, I feel very deeply. I feel big and I feel deep and I feel a lot. Um, and I don't really can get be lonely from, and hard. Oh, oh, it's very, yeah, no, it's lonely in here. It's scary in here. Um, you know, I, I'm actually working actively and this is something that Jonathan, my podcast partner has really been working on with me for really about three years. Um, you know, I don't really get restful sleep. And um, he got me one of those ring trackers that confirmed what he knew. I don't get restful sleep. And so I'm actually trying to learn to just like give myself that gift because like I'll, I will write in my sleep. I will speak Yiddish. I'll write speeches. Like I don't, I, I need to also care for myself so that I can continue to have more to give, you know, and I think my children, you know, my, my children see that they share me, you know, they share me with everyone. Um, and I, I do need to make sure that it's still clear to them as much as I can that, you know, to communicate to them that they still are like, they're it. It's me and them, you know, in that, in that house, it's me and them. Um, and I, I need to take the time, you know, to make sure that I fix the things in our life that need repair and love and time and attention um, and not just to, you know, to look outward. And what do people not know about you? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I share, if you listen to my podcast, you probably know most things. Um, most people are surprised that I, I do not feel very confident um, a lot of the time. Most people are surprised to hear that I'm very, um, in many ways, I'm very meticulous. Um, I, I love cleaning. I love organizing, but I also can be very messy. Um, meaning like dirt, like things that have like a little dirt on them don't bother me to the extent that they bother other people. Like if something comes out of the dishwasher, my children are like, this is horrible out of the machine. It's like, we just, just wipe it on your pants. It's fine. It's all good. So people are often surprised to hear that. Um, people are often surprised, you know, cause I have a, a doctorate in neuroscience that I believe in God. Um, and then a lot of people are surprised that someone with a belief in God, like I have, you know, is a scientist. Uh, but I think most people, I think hopefully have heard me talk about that enough. Um, yeah, the, those are, those are the, um, those are kind of the biggies. Yeah. So a couple of questions that I have to just ask people want to know where to buy the ring. They want to know where to watch call me cat. They want to know when you're going to be the full-time host, they want you to comment about Dave Chappelle more. I mean, the questions <laughs> keep coming in fast and furious. So maybe you can like 
go on your website to answer those. But I want to say a couple other things about you is that um, to be a Jew so proudly in Hollywood not only takes bravery publicly, but it also takes bravery privately. So do you ask for kosher food on set? Do you ask for Shabbat off? Like, how do you navigate that? Because that question's come up a lot. Yeah, um, you know, I've I've honestly been really, um, you know, I I have to give a shout out to um, a man named Shep Rosenman, who is- who we share uh, and love. Thank well, you, Shep, lot, for making this happen. A lot of people share um, this one man. He's like one of those like hubs, you know, of the Jewish world. Um, he, I used to teach his kids neuroscience in the homeschool community. And his wife came home one day from like a homeschool day at the park and was like, I met the most interesting lady. She's a neuroscientist. And he was like, was her name Mayim Bialik? And his wife was like, yes, who's that? And he was like, that's Mayim Bialik. Like that's like a really <laughs> famous neuroscientist. And anyway, so I ended up, you know, kind of becoming part of his like extended family, which a lot of people are. And he ended up then becoming my entertainment lawyer, which means that, you know, he is my spiritual partner in business, meaning he helps me navigate um, how I can um, not work on Yom Tovim, you know, on, on the religious holidays. Um, I'm grateful that I do tape on Tuesday nights instead of Friday nights. That was an accident, which I'm happy to keep going. Um, I like to say I may be the only, you know, person in history to have the word Shemini Atzeret in my contract. Um, that is, a, I'm a sure holiday. you're the only one in history. Yeah, that's a, that's a holiday that many people don't have, you know, on their radar. Um, you know, I, I don't do it perfectly, which is why I don't wave the flag of, of modern orthodoxy, even of the, you know, leftist variety. Um, but I, I do it perfectly to the best of my ability um, in this industry. I happen to be vegan, which, um, you know, means that, I do get to um, eat a lot of raw food, which is, you know, um, very safe. And I do eat out at restaurants. I eat out, you know, vegan, which still has its complexity. You know, I've toyed with with different levels, even of of kosher observance above being vegan or below, depending on which side of it you're on. Um, but I've been inspired also by people like Sasha Baron Cohen, you know, who who I know do make um, those kind of restrictions and things happen. Um, you know, I think people would really be surprised to hear that um, I don't have as much power as people assume that I do. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm often, you know, a, a humble actor, you know, working around things like food and holidays and, and things like that. Um, I don't wear pants on Call Me Cat. I, I, you know, have largely, I've not, I think I've worn pants on a red carpet maybe once or twice, like in my life. Um, for I, modesty I, purposes, yeah, yeah, I, I, I kept the laws of Tznius that way um, as much as possible for those listeners. Uh, yeah, for a, modesty, as we call it, which there are rules for men as well. People are like, hey, there are rules for men as well. Um, so yeah, there's there's certain things that um, you know that I don't have control over though, but um, the things that I can do as gracefully as I can, I do, and I also try and make sure to you know, sort of um, educate people if they're curious, meaning I'm not like, here's why I'm off for Shemini Atzeret, um, but meaning to be open to saying like, hey, this is a holiday. This is what I do and don't do. If I do have to work or when I have had to work on a Yantiv in the past, I I usually try and do something a little different. I'll, I'll dress up to go to work. Um, I, you know, I won't use my phone or I'll have a car service instead of driving. It really, it depends and it varies over the years. Um, my older son, who's been homeschooled his whole life, just started going to a, um, a, a religious um, school. So it's really nice because now he and I have the same calendar, which is really <laughs> super helpful. I was going to say, my kids also do a school and it's really uh, Very helpful. It's We're all on the same. So school. we've got to wrap up in a moment. A couple of things. One, we heard because you're a vegan, and gluten-free that you have a birthday coming up this week. I do. So your assistant is about to bring in cupcakes and we oh want to celebrate you, Mayim, with vegan gluten-free cupcakes because oh you gosh. are the goat. You seriously, Thank every you. Jewish actor, actress out there, take a note to have the kind of transparency <laughs> and pride. So I think the cupcakes are coming in oh now with a candle. They are coming what? in now. Thank you, Valerie. We want to say first, happy birthday to someone who has really made a difference in all of our lives. Thank and you. And really lives and walks and walks and talks. That's from all of us at AJU. That is and we want really to say from a thousand watchers, 1,500 registrants, happy birthday. Go good. Make a wish. Then, I wish for world peace. I did. Good. I did. I just did it. <laughs> so 
Two things I want to end with. One is you said, we're all here trying to do our best. And that's a challenge that I'm eager to be a part of as a human. I read that in something you wrote, one of your books, as well as ultimately we're all in this together. The question is how we get through it together. Mime, I want to tell you, you are leading the way for how we get through this together. I couldn't be more so proud of you. I think your ancestors are in shock that this is your career when they came over. And I couldn't be more proud of you. And I speak on behalf of the literally 108 comments, literally talking about what you've done. And those are the people that have written in. We're thank incredibly you. grateful to you. We want to thank you so much thank for you. all of us from American Jewish University and Maven. Be well, stay well, happy birthday, and a happy Hanukkah to each and every one of you. Thank you. Hag Hanukkah Sameach. Hag Hanukkah Sameach. Bye, everybody. I think I go away now. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Oh, <gasps>